Today we're starting chapter 15 and what we're doing in this chapter is continuing an exploration of what kinds of patterns of electric field in space are possible and what kinds of arrangements of source charges make these patterns of electric field. Um, this turns out to be an important theme in electricity and magnetism and in fact during the, at the, near the end of the semester we'll find that a set of four equations which are called Maxwell's equations describe all the possible patterns of electric field and magnetic field in space and also uh, indicate that there's some patterns that we just can't make and we just can't see. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about how we might um, predict and understand the electric field due to macroscopic objects that are covered with, with a uniform distribution of charge. For example, I think in lab you rubbed a plastic rod or a pen with wool or fur or something like that giving it a, a roughly uniform <coughs> charge along the surface due to contact interactions. What kind of electric field does that really make? You know, we approximated those as point charges, but it's obviously not a point charge. So we want to know what sorts of, of patterns of electric field are actually possible and what they, might, what they might do. We're also interested in, as a, as a part of this, we're interested in distance dependences. We've already seen two different distance dependences of the electric field of, of simple charge distributions. A point charge makes an electric field that falls off like 1 over distance squared, right? And a dipole, on the other hand, makes an electric field that falls off like 1 over distance cubed. cubed. So with one, of the, one of the things we're going to be exploring is um, tendencies we can see and what uh, and along special directions we actually were able to calculate analytically an approximate expression for the field on the axis of the dipole or on the axis perpendicular to the dipole, but we did not try to do analytically interesting angles. Um, <coughs> so today we're talking, we're starting a discussion of the electric field due to what we call distributed charges, meaning macroscopic objects that have uniform charge distributions on their surfaces. And the first thing we're going to talk about, partly because it's simple, but partly because it's actually realistic, is a long, thin, charged rod. So think long glass or plastic rod. You've rubbed it with silk if it's glass, or wool or fur if it's plastic, rubber. Um, it's quite thin. And we're going to about how to calculate the the electric field due to a charge distribution like this. And we're going to do it two ways. We can do it numerically, and we can also use calculus to get analytical expressions in some symmetrical situations. And we're going to work on both of these things for the next couple of classes. Uh, we're also going to see translating physics into calculus, something that that uh, not everybody's clear about from their math classes, which is this, this integration variable thing, this little d well, is not just a decoration. <laughs> it's actually really important. And in physics, there turns out to be a lot of physics in this quantity that we have to pay attention to. Uh, <coughs> so various things will happen. <coughs> so what we're going to start with is imagining that we have <coughs> Uh, a rod that's a meter long and I don't have a rod that's a meter long because the meter the stick ground. is ah there it is <coughs> so imagine that we have what did I do this is dangerous imagine that we have a long very thin plastic rod that's a meter long. <coughs> and we rub it carefully all over with <coughs> wool so that it acquires a roughly uniform distribution of charge on the outside. It's probably charged positive. Uh, oh, negative, sorry. <coughs> um, 
So actually, let's make it a glass rod and rub it with silk so it's positive, just to make our life simple so we don't have to worry about too much about directions. <coughs> so a very long stirring rod, we rub it with your silk handkerchief, which you always carry in your pocket, and it's charged uniformly positive. <coughs> and we want to calculate the electric field at various locations due to a rod like this. <coughs> so how are we going to do this? Because we don't know quite how to start, so we have <coughs> this long rod-like object. But we don't have an equation for what you do with a rod-like object. <coughs> now presumably there are <coughs> locations here that there are deficiencies of electrons. And if we could count every excess proton and knew exactly where it was, then we could just take every excess proton and calculate the electric field of that and add that up and that should give us the electric field of the, the long glass rod. But we don't have a view of the rod at that level of resolution. We don't know where all these excess charges on the surface are. <coughs> so what we do is we say, well, we'll start by making an approximation. And so what we'll do is, we'll approximately, we'll just say, okay, let's imagine that this long rod can be cut up into lots of little pieces. So we virtually cut up the rod, draw little lines to divide it in a whole bunch of little pieces. And we'll say, <coughs> these little pieces probably have a charge that's more than the charge of one proton, but we will approximate each piece as if it were a point charge. So we're gonna take the charge of this piece, pretend that Superman came along and compressed the piece to a little point, at the location of this piece and then we can say we can calculate the electric field of that point charge and that one 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 at our observation location of interest and then we'll add those up and we can get the electric field and you can probably see that where calculus is going to come in is that if we make these pieces smaller and smaller we have more and more and more and more and more of these pieces Eventually, we can make them infinitesimally small, and then we can write our addition as an integral, and then possibly we'll be able to do the integral anal symbolically, analytically, and maybe we won't. Maybe we're gonna have to do it numerically anyway, but that's, a, that's the enterprise that we're gonna be embarking on today. <coughs> so, um, so let's consider a rod that's a meter long. <coughs> and uh, it's got an electric, it's making, and it's rubbed uniformly with, it's, it's a glass rod. It has a charge of plus plus Q uniformly distributed over it and we're going to find pick a location to calculate the electric field by cutting the rod up into pieces and then um, and then adding them up now there are lots of places we could do this but there's a particularly symmetric uh, the symmetry of the situation suggests a set of locations that might be particularly easy to do and so if we draw an axis going through the middle of the rod, <coughs> there's as much charge up here as there is down there. And so we should see a pattern in the field we get at locations anywhere here along this axis. So this axis is kind of a special axis because of the symmetry of the situation and that makes our life easier mathematically. Um, if we want to do it somewhere else, we're probably going to have to do it numerically. <laughs> um, so let's actually um, let's actually do this uh, numerically first. 
So let's say Q is 30 nanocoulombs. <coughs> And the rod is, is one meter long. And we're going to pick a location that's four centimeters um, on the x-axis. So this is our observation location. And, and obviously, this looks like a, this is not to scale, because if this is supposed to be a meter long, then four centimeters would be about here. But I'm exaggerating so that we can draw arrows, right? <coughs> and so let's, let's make the origin here. <coughs> and we'll call this piece one, piece two, piece three, piece four. And let's see. <coughs> let's divide the room into four parts. <coughs> so. Uh, this side, you guys up through Robert's Row, you guys are piece one, you guys are piece two, you folks are piece three, you guys are piece four. What I want you to do is calculate the electric field due to your piece at this location. So take a minute and think about what you're going to need to do to do that. The origin is in the center of the rod, but we are assuming the rod is very, very thin. If it's a thick rod, it gets slightly more complicated. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a thin rod. <coughs> So if you don't quite understand what you're supposed to be doing, please ask. <coughs> yes? Yes, your section makes your section makes a field at our observation location. Um, okay, so we're okay. So, so Tristan's asking an interesting question, which is, where is your piece? It's the middle of the number, right? So you want it to be the location is going to be the middle of the section, isn't it? That's the best approximation, <coughs> right? So. So we're going to put So we're going to assume that these these point charges by which we're this are are in the middle of our piece and as the pieces get smaller of course So what's the first thing we have to do Yeah find the location of the piece right <laughs> What? You want the value of 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0? All right. Well, even if you don't have an answer, I'm going to stop you here, and we'll we'll go on. Did anyone act, did anyone get an answer for their piece? Did you guys get an answer? I have a Actually, most of us don't have a number, but let's talk about what we were doing when we did this. <coughs> Do you have a number? No. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Kendra. You have a number. Awesome for piece two. So piece two. Um, 
It's a vector. <laughs> okay, so, and this is piece two. Ah, which one should be negative? Okay. <clears throat> so, so let's talk about what you did to get this number. And I don't know if it's right or not. We'll have to, we need to. <clears throat> but first you had to find <clears throat> the location of the center of this piece, right? And so, <clears throat> this is half a meter. That's, a, that's 0.25 meters. That's half of that. So the location must have been something like... Um, <clears throat> So that'd be 12 and a half centimeters, right? So point <coughs> one, two, five <coughs> meters. What? Oh. <coughs> and then you had to figure out R. R from the source to the observation location <coughs> and you had to calculate R so that was 0 0.0400 meters minus 0, 0 0.1250 meters <coughs> and then you had to decide how much charge was on the piece right so how much charge is on the piece <coughs> A fourth, okay, so <clears throat> so we'll say delta Q is 30 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs divided by 4. <coughs> oh, right, okay, the charge is all on that one piece, is it? <coughs> and then... Um, <coughs> And then you know you've memorized, because you have to, the electric field of a point charge. <coughs> and so you said, we'll say delta E2 is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. <coughs> this delta Q over the magnitude of your R squared, R hat, so you had to calculate R hat in here to get that. <coughs> and you got an electric field that <coughs> that looked like that. <coughs> okay, so does that make sense? You get that, okay. And <coughs> if anybody had gotten an answer for piece three, Yeah, it should, <coughs> so it's the, the distance away is the same, but R and R hat are, so this is R2, this is R3. <coughs> because these things are equidistant, <coughs> which component of the electric field should be different? The y. the y component should be different. This one's gonna be pointing up. <coughs> And presumably, one is going to make an electric field that way, and four will make an electric field that way, same magnitude, but Y is... <coughs> when you add all these up, what's going to happen to the Y component? The y component is going to be zero, isn't it? So we're going to end up, when we add up all these things, with a net electric field that <coughs> looks like that and it's just the sum of the contribution of all these little pieces. <coughs> so that's, that's what we're doing. Okay, we're just adding. That's all it is. <coughs> 
Um, <clears throat> so that's the that's that's the process we're doing. But now we want to do it in a slightly more general way. And I can <coughs> here. Let's look at an example of. Um, <coughs> again <coughs> so here's a <coughs> here's a computer program that does this at various locations let's make <coughs> let's divide our rod into four pieces um, so there's our four point charges except that looks like five <coughs> <coughs> and we see we can get an electric field at, along any direction. <coughs> what do you think will happen if we <coughs> increase uh, the number of point charges that we use? What if we make it 10? <coughs> We're calculating the electric field the same way by summing up the contributions of every point charge, but at a whole bunch of observation locations. <coughs> okay, well, possibly. Seems odd that the electric field looks bigger here than here. Do you think that's an effect of just how many point charges we've got and what they are? Let's add a lot of point charges. <coughs> Let's make it 40. Ah, <coughs> uh, let's speed it up. Better. <coughs> okay, so we get an electric field that's pointing away from the rod. These are all equidistant from the rod, right? <coughs> um, they're not all in the same direction. <coughs> But what we did in the program is what you just did on paper. <coughs> and, and that really is a, a standard way to find the electric field of a charged object. Okay, so we could do that, and we will do that in lab. <coughs> but what we're gonna do here is try to get an analytical expression for the electric field at one set of locations along this axis because that might give us a distance dependence and we'd be interested in that. We'd get an algebraic expression that has a distance dependence. And then we'll look and see where we think that expression could be valid. So that's what we're planning on doing here. <coughs> so let's start over and do the same thing but do it algebraically. <coughs> So here's our rod, <coughs> here's the midline, we want an observation location at some location that's going to be x0,0. zero, zero. <coughs> the length of the rod is L, the charge on the whole rod is Q, because <coughs> we're doing this symbolically. And we still want to go through this procedure of So the first thing we do is we pick a representative little piece. So it can't be in a special location because we want to make sure that it's got all the components of electric field that it would have. So this is too special a location on the midline and probably the endpoints aren't the greatest either. So we'll just pick some representative piece here. Uh, we'll say it has a charge 
delta Q, which is we're dividing the rod into a bunch of pieces this size and each one has a charge delta Q. The, the height of this little piece is going to be delta Y because delta Y is just the length of the rod over the number of pieces we're, we're dividing it into, right? So if we divide it into 20 pieces, it'll be L over 20. If we divide it into 100 pieces, it'll be L over 100. You, we divided it into four pieces <coughs> when we did it on paper, and therefore each piece was one quarter of a meter. <coughs> and now we need the position of this piece, because remember you needed the position of the center of your piece to do this numerically. And so the position we're going to call just So the position of the center of this piece <coughs> is just Y, starting from our origin here. <coughs> and so, here let me write the delta Q over here. <coughs> the location of this piece is going to be Y, zero, zero. I mean, not that. Zero, Y, zero. <coughs> and now we're going to go through exactly the same process we just went through, except with algebra. <coughs> so we need the vector R, which always goes from the source location, this is the thing creating the electric field, to the observation location, the place where we're going to put a charge to see where it's, how it's affected by the field. <coughs> and so here's our vector R. <coughs> and R is, of course, final minus initial. So it looks like x negative y is zero, and we want to check to make sure that makes sense. Yes, it's going in the plus x direction and the minus y direction, so it looks like we did that subtraction correctly. <coughs> the magnitude of r <coughs> is going to be the square root of x squared plus minus y squared, <coughs> which we'll write as the square root of x squared plus y squared because <coughs> we don't need to worry about that minus sign because we're squaring it. <coughs> and our hat is therefore x minus y zero divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared. <coughs> right? <coughs> Okay. <coughs> now in order to use the electric field of a point charge equation, we need to have an expression for the amount of charge on this piece. And this is really a key point of this calculation because it always, almost always turns out that our integration variable, the thing we're summing over, is hiding in the expression for the amount of charge on the piece. So this is something we want to be kind of careful about. <coughs> so our delta Q <coughs> is just the total charge divided by the number of pieces. <coughs> well, we have some arbitrary number of pieces. We don't quite know what it is, but <coughs> since <coughs> Um, the number of pieces, it looks like, is going to be L over delta Y, right? So that's Q divided by the length of the whole rod divided by the height of one of our pieces. And that gives us a L times a delta Y. <coughs> and there are a couple different ways of thinking about this expression physically. One is that 
This is the charge per meter, the charge per unit length. So half of the rod would have half that charge, the rod twice as long would have twice the total charge. So this is the, the charge per meter, and then you divide by, you, you multiply by the height of our little piece in meters to give us that charge. <clears throat> you can also think of it as the total charge divided by the fraction of the rod, the fraction of the height of the rod. <clears throat> so there's a, but, <clears throat> but it turns out this delta Y here is a very important thing because this is, this is how we're going to be able to transform this sum into an integral. And so we, we don't have a delta something in there. Uh, we can't actually do, do any math. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so now let's write this up here. We have a delta Q is, we'll write it as the charge per unit length times delta Y in the height of our piece. <coughs> And now we are ready to write the expression for the electric field of this piece. We'll just use the electric field of a point charge. <coughs> I'm going to write it as delta E because it's not, it's only a little piece of this sum. Okay, we're going to add up all these delta E's. So it's going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. We want our Q. So our delta Q is Q over L delta Y <coughs> over the magnitude of R squared, which gives us an X squared plus Y squared square root squared <coughs> times R hat, which is X negative Y zero divided by X squared plus Y squared to the one half. <coughs> which gives us a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 <coughs> Q over L delta Y over X squared plus Y squared to the 3 halves multiplying those bottom expressions times X negative Y 0 so that's our that's our expression for electric field <coughs> Questions so far? Did I do it right? Okay. <coughs> now what we want is, is the total electric field is just going to be the sum of all these little pieces, these little contributions due to all our little pieces, right? <coughs> and so at this point, we could just plug, we could, we could do it numerically by plugging in numbers. We can decide how many pieces we want. We can plug in a number for L, a number for N, a number for Q. We can, okay. <clears throat> but what we want to do is try to do it <clears throat> mathematically. And it's simpler to, um, to do different components, to separate it into X and Y components at this point. So the X component, uh, is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q over L <coughs> delta Y over X squared plus Y squared to the 3 halves times X which is our distance from along the X axis to the observation location <coughs> And delta E sub Y is got a lot of the same stuff. Q over L, delta Y, X squared plus Y squared to the 3 halves times a negative Y. <coughs> okay, so... What we want to do here is make the transition to an integral by making our pieces smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller until they're infinitesimally small. Right? <coughs> so 
what is our integration variable here? What is it that's varying as we add up all these pieces? So dy is a little, yeah, delta y is a little piece of it. Y is our, basically, we're integrating along. Y is changing, right? So, so we need a, we want to make sure there's a dy. That's going to happen in both cases because as we take the limit and we make delta y goes smaller and smaller and smaller, it turns into a dy, an infinitesimal dy. <coughs> so we can write this expression as... <coughs> An integral, one of epsilon zero, q over l, x dy over x squared plus y squared to the three halves. But it's 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 a definite integral, right? We have a definite number of pieces to add up. We're not going forever. So what? What are our integration limits here? If y is our integration variable, Jonathan? Okay, so the top, okay, so the value of y, so Jonathan's saying the length is what we need to worry about, and he's saying the maximum value of y is going to be L over 2 because we, we've gone, we put the origin in the center, so this is L over 2 up there. So that would be and what about the, the other limit? Negative L over 2, right? <coughs> And likewise, for the y component, we have an integral of 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over l. We have a negative y dy over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. And the integration limits are the same, right? So minus l over 2 to l over 2. Now, um, what of these, which of this stuff is constants? Epsilon. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is a constant. Q and L are both constants. X is a constant. <laughs> that's right. So the only thing that's varying here is, is Y. Y is the only variable. Now at this point, your calculus course uh, is Okay, you do something fancy to get, okay, but we don't, we've done all the physics. <laughs> At this point, we just care about what the value of this expression is. All the, all the interesting physics work has been done. So I don't care how you get this integral. You can do it yourself. You can look it up. You can use Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Um, but... <coughs> Uh, but it's, it's, just, it's just math. It's not, not physics. So we find, if we do this, that we get, I better get this right. Um, we get an E sub X that's 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over l x <coughs> times y over uh, <coughs> x squared x squared plus y squared to the 1 half from L over 2 to minus L over 2, which gives us a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Q divided by X times the square root of 
x squared plus L over 2 squared. <coughs> if you are ambitious, you can, you can work that out for yourselves. <coughs> You can differentiate this. <coughs> what do you think E sub y comes out to? Yeah. <laughs> no, Jonathan's right. What is it physically? What is E sub y going to come out to? Yeah, zero. <coughs> That's right. <coughs> and it does, which you can check. <coughs> So all the physics was in setting up this integral and deciding what it is we had to add up. And then it becomes math, either do calculus, look it up in a table, ask Wolfram Alpha, write a, write a computer program to do it numerically. Okay. Um, so really though, we saw from that vPython program that this field actually was cylindrically symmetric, right? So the electric field at this location had the same magnitude as that location, right? So, so x is sort of not the right variable here. We really kind of want to be in cylindrical coordinates. So what we'll do is we're going to write it as <coughs> 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over r times the square root r squared plus l over 2 squared where r <coughs> is the distance from the center of the rod to the observation location. What is that formula for? This is the electric field of the of the rod along some axis coming out here, except instead of calling it x, we're calling it r because this would be true no matter, no matter which of the axes perpendicular to the rod we chose. So in cylindrical coordinates, your values are uh, r, theta, and z. So it's like polar coordinates with an r and a theta, except that we've got a, a z component. <coughs> And this is, now this is a very special, and it, this is on the perpendicular axis. <coughs> so it's a very special case formula. It only tells us the field along this, this axis. It does not tell it what the field is going to be here, right? <coughs> now the first thing we want to do is check to make sure that this actually makes some sense. And we did one check. I mean, the integral really does come out to zero, and you guys said physically it should come out to zero, and it does on the y component. But what else could we check to see if this is a reasonable expression? Compared to the vortex. Well, yeah. Could you compare it to a point charge? Awesome. Okay, so we, we, so we could compare it to a point charge. That's a very physical, physical thing, and we should definitely do this. What about this check that you all go, oh yeah, I should be doing this. We could check the units. <laughs> it better come out to newtons per coulomb, right? So let's see if it does. This is newton meters squared per coulomb squared. We've got coulombs. We've got meters times the square root of meters squared. <coughs> so that's obviously a meters. So those cancel, this cancels, and we have newtons per coulomb. So at least we got the right units. This is a check we always want to do in these situations because if we've made an algebra mistake, our units are likely not to work out. And it's a fairly easy thing to catch. <coughs> Now comparing it to a point charge, well that's an interesting one and it's a very physical check. And the idea is this, suppose that you are really far away. So you're farther away than the back, in the back of the room this still looks like a, a long rod, right? 
But if you're far enough away that it just kind of looks like a little blob, then maybe the electric field kind of ought to look like the electric field of a point charge. So how would we do that? So far away, so this is units. If you're far away, well, algebraically, what's true here of R and L if you're far, very, very far from this rod? What's big and what's What's bigger than what? So R is really big. And so we could say that, that when you're very far away, the L over 2 is approximately 0, compared to L over 2 is much less than R. We get 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q over R times the square root of R squared, which gives us 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q over R squared, which does look like a point charge. So that was a great suggestion, and it's a very physical check on, on whether this makes any sense. <coughs> now we kind of do have a distance dependence here, <coughs> but it's not, um, it's not a very pretty one. So this is, this is an equation we've derived for the electric field at any location on the midline, an axis perpendicular to a rod. But it's not exactly clear how it, um, how it changes with distance. But there's a, so we considered, we considered a very special case. We considered a case where where R was much, 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 much bigger than L. Another thing we can do is consider another special case where R is much, 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 much smaller than L, so you're super close to the rod. <coughs> so let's see what happens if you're super close to the rod. So, so if you're very close to the rod, R is much smaller than L. And so we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon Q O. Okay, what can we do here? Now we've got R involved in two pieces of this expression. This is a sum, but this is a product. Now if we just say R is zero in both of these cases, we get Q over zero and that's a problem because then it's infinite and that's probably not a very good approximation. <laughs> so that's not the right thing. But in this piece in the sum, so let's, actually let's, let's write R times the square root of r squared plus l over 2 quantity squared. In this piece, we could say r squared is much less than l over 2 squared. <coughs> so we can say that approximately we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 <coughs> q over r times the square root of l over 2 quantity squared, where r was negligible in this sum. And so we get a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. There's a Q over R. And there's a 2, 2Q over LR. Or we could actually write it like this. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 2 times Q over L, the charge per unit length, divided by R. <coughs> and the only variable in this expression is R. So it looks like if you're close to this rod, the electric field is falling off like 1 over R. So we had a 1 over R squared, we have a 1 over R cubed, now we have a, 
a region where the electric field is falling off like like one over R. <coughs> so how good is that uh, approximation? So let's see here. Um, So what this program does is and the approximate equation and just plots them as a function of r <coughs> as we go away from the rod for some values of some I don't know what the values were I used here <coughs> but so the exact if we use the exact expression that's the red the red curve <coughs> um, so we're using this equation here. And if we use this approximate expression with the one over r, that's the blue. And you can see that when you're very close to the rod, it's really good. <coughs> and as you get farther and farther away, it diverges a, a bit, not a whole lot. I mean, for, for many purposes. Um, uh, Another thing, what was the other thing? It was something else I wanted to do. What was it? Oh. Uh, another interesting question to ask. Is it really worth all that work to calculate the electric field, to get an analytical expression for the electric field when we only got it in one really special set of locations along the midline here. So how good is, how useful is this equation or, or that equation <coughs> for real? <coughs> so one thing to do is to uh, just look at it, just see. So what this program's doing is it's doing a numerical calculation of the field of the rod. So it's dividing the rod into 100 little pieces, which is, turns out to be quite good. I think it's 100. Let me see how many it's doing. Um, 50. So it's dividing the rod into 50 pieces. And then it's going to calculate the, and display the electric field as it, with an arrow wherever I click. And it's, uh, it's constrained to do this at the same distance from the rod. So, so the, the distance r is going to be the same distance here, no matter where. So the only thing I'm allowed to vary here is y and not x. OK, so here's the orange arrow representing the electric field on the midline due to this calculation. Now if we click up here, um, we see that that's pretty different really, really different. So if we're near the end of the rod, that is a totally useless equation. E sub y is not zero. The magnitude's different. But let's see how, how far away from the midline we can get. So let's, let's move a little ways and calculate the field. That looks pretty similar, actually. Let's move a little further and try it. Okay, we might be getting a tiny y component, but it's not, it's not that bad. Um, now we're, gosh, we're almost halfway up, and that's still not a bad. Uh, it's still pretty similar to the field on the axis. We have to go pretty far before the y component starts, the magnitude starts to decrease, and the y component starts to get significant. So it turns out that what we've derived, although it's, it's exact only along the axis, is actually a reasonably good uh, equation to use if we're not near the end of a rod. So we've done somewhat general. <coughs> so what are you supposed to take away from this? <coughs> so are you supposed to remember these, memorize these equations? No, you're not. That's correct. You're not. <laughs> um, <coughs> What you're supposed to take away from this is a procedure for calculating the electric field 
for um, for distributed charges and we're going to practice doing this. So the first thing is that we divide our distribution into into pieces. And this is what we're going to do whether we're doing it numerically with a computer or we're doing it analytically. And what we're going to do is and draw the contribution of a representative piece Second is, we need an algebraic expression for this delta E. And that involves a whole bunch of stuff. It involves an origin, an axis. We need delta Q, which should give us our integration variable. So that's, there's a lot of physics in that. Step three. Step three is uh, we've done all the physics we add. This could be evaluating an integral, it could be writing a computer program to add it numerically, it could be and okay, this is just math. What's step four? Step four is really important. Check. Check. <laughs> so we check units and we check uh, special locations. So So if you're far away, does it look like a point charge? And if you're really close, does it make sense? So that's that's the takeaway message. That's what that's what we do when we're calculating the electric field of distributed charges. And that's what we're going to be practicing in recitation and next week and in homework. Yes? So our delta Q was the charge on one piece, right? And when we got, we got, so we could just call it delta Q, but it turns out when we express, we want to express it in terms of what turns out to be our integration variable. Our, our delta y, our delta x, our delta r, our delta theta, whatever our integration variable is, is probably hiding in that, del in that delta q. And so we have to be very careful to pay attention to that in order to get an expression that we can really add up.